Hey friends, welcome to the People Priority Podcast, where we dig into topics that help you show up as your best self for you and your circle of influence. I'm your host, Julie Schneers, a teacher turned speaker, team culture consultant, and leadership growth coach who loves people. Join me here every week for conversations that will motivate, educate, and hopefully just inspire you to grow through the power of communication, connection, and confidence. Because you and your people, you're worth it. Today's episode, I have Jeff Harnoy. He is the CEO of iBridge. He's a passionate about helping people and teams reach new heights in performance using key diagnostics like Myers-Briggs and Everything Disc. You've probably heard of these tools, but today Jeff's going to break them down with you a little bit while he goes over my results today, which will be super interesting. Uh, And let me tell you a little bit more about iBridge. This is a consulting and coaching firm dedicated to helping teams and people perform at their highest levels. They've worked with brands like Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook. This team is incredible. Their focus is on uncovering insights that enable and empower organizations to create culture of high performance. They are masters of amplifying strengths while minimizing blind spots. And who does not want help with that? Jeff's insights often lead to significant improvements in our three C's, communication, connection, and confidence. So that's what we're going to dig into a little bit more today. And that's why I wanted him here. Hey, Jeff, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Hi, Julie. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so we have to start with I've already done this evaluation and we've kind of walked through it. I learned a ton, uh, but tell us a little bit about Myers-Briggs just for someone who may not have heard about the test or know what we're digging into. Yeah, Myers-Briggs is um, under the category of psychometric assessment. The word psychometric sounds a little bit like the measurement of psychology. And when we do these tests on individuals, we get a really deep insight in understanding about things like their communication preferences and style, um, where they go get their energy from, what kind of information they like to process. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, a bit today. But also we can understand things like how they approach conflict or Mm. how they approach stress. We also understand things like Um, what drains you or what exhausts you in relationships. And then I think one of the key things is really when we understand those elements about ourselves, and then we understand those elements about others, we can find really clear, cohesive paths for coming together. Which is important when you are working as a team, when you're trying to build culture. Yeah. Or even in individual relationships. Um, Oh, for sure. Right. You you may recall um, I was first exposed to Myers Briggs. Yeah, I probably shouldn't shouldn't list the amount of time, but it was a long time ago. Uh, my wife also had some exposure to it. Turns out we are not the same personality type. Um, but we've used what we've learned from those assessments. And, you know, in February it'll be 40 years together oh, wow. in our marriage. And you know, a portion of that is is attributable to understanding how best Mm -hmm. to work together as a couple. Mm -hmm. Well, and I talk a little bit about the power of relationship building, that connection piece, right? And I, I say, man, you are not going to be able to show up as your best self as a leader, uh, leading your people. If you don't know your people, you're going to have to build that relationship to get to know them. But this is kind of just the hack to do that. This kind of gives you the keys to the kingdom a lot faster Uh, especially if you're a new leader in that space. I I really love that observation because it's so true. One of the things that we talk about with teams and with team leaders in particular is that every team is unique like a fingerprint. Every single team is unique like a fingerprint. That means what they need from you is going to be, needs to be highly customized to them and for them. Yeah. And if you don't understand the design of the fingerprint, then it's impossible for you to give them what they need to be successful. Mm. That's such a good analogy. Yeah. yeah. We talk with leaders a lot who are sometimes very um, driven and they see things in a certain way. And 
They know what's worked for them in the past. And so they try to replicate that on new teams as an example. And then they can't quite figure out why it's not working. Well, it worked before. Why isn't it working now? And the reality is it's always that fingerprint, which is now different. Yeah, could feel a little bit different. Okay, so what we're going to kind of talk about a little bit are my results. And you're going to give us tips and tricks in some of those spaces. But I want to share. So if you are familiar with it, I am an ENFJ. Okay, so we have no idea what that means if you're not familiar with it. So tell us a little bit about the code there. Yeah, so Myers-Briggs is based on 16 distinct personality types. You have one of those 16 types, ENFJ. The E element is for extroversion. And so we often see extroverted folks who are lively. Sometimes they're a little bit loud. Often they're very expressive. They talk with their hands and their face, and there's a lot of physical movement going on. Um, Extroverted types are very engaging. Often we'll see extroverts as the life of the party and the center of attention. The other side of that dichotomy is introversion. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of introverts who have a tendency to be a little quieter, maybe a little more still in their body and in their presentation. Oftentimes, they appear to be a little more thoughtful when you ask a question. There may be a pause. And for extroverts, that may look like disengagement or arrogance or being aloof when in reality, introversion is really about sort of being in your own head versus being extra extroversion in the world. Yeah. So your piece is extroversion. My side of that equation is introversion. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that about each other when I show up with you, I want to bring a little more energy. I want to be a little lot more alive. I want to have a little faster pace so that you and I can connect more quickly and more deeply just on that particular dichotomy alone. The next element is sensing and intuition. This is your N, N for intuition. You and I share this particular attribute. Hmm. Folks with an intuition preference have a tendency to be more theoretical in their thought process. They have a tendency to see a bigger picture. And when we think about theoretical as a concept, um, you can see there's a pretty strong alignment in there with strategy. Strategy is future state. Strategy hasn't happened. It's about we're thinking about what's going to happen. And so we're very comfortable working in that space. But on the other side of that dichotomy is sensing. And sensing folks are generally significantly better at tactics because they're very focused on what's real and what's tangible and what's in front of them right now. And so you and I might be having a conversation about stars and light years and, you know, very conceptual and theoretical. And a person with an S preference might be like, I don't really know what you guys are talking about or even want to know what you guys are talking about. I can feel the warmth of the sun and I can see the light of the moon. Those things are very real and very tangible. So from a communication standpoint, you and I have to sort of recalibrate what we're talking about and turn something that might be theoretical or conceptual or strategic into uh, what do I do with this information? How do I handle it? How do I operationalize it for us to be able to connect with sensing types? Does that make sense? Mm, For sure. And uh, this, you know, I'm thinking through when I started my journey as a speaker, I, I was thinking like, okay, what does big picture look like? And, yeah. and and I started big and I tried to build backwards, which for me is sometimes a little overwhelming because I, mm-hmm. I'm not great at breaking it down into bite-sized pieces. And so I, sometimes I let it overwhelm me, but I can see I'm very strategic, uh, which might also mean that it takes it longer for it to come together because I was strategically thinking about this really big picture. Um, yeah, just pros and cons of being a sensing versus intuition, I guess. One of the simple ways of understanding, or maybe not understanding, but learning how to cross the bridge between the two is that folks with that end preference or the intuition preference are very driven by the question, why? Mm -hmm. Why are we doing this? Why did this happen? You know, why are we going in this direction? Conversely, folks with an S type are very interested in what and how. What are we doing and how are we going to do it? And you can see how different those perspectives are. Yeah. And that's also why it's really important that I hire people who are sensing. Like I, I need the what and how people on my team to help me 
navigate my uh, inness. That's a really important observation. And the reason it's important is um, if we don't have balance from that perspective, mm-hmm. then we usually end up missing really big opportunities and yeah. we're significantly less successful in trying to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. So from our perspective, from you know, as a consulting firm, when we're working with leaders, we work really hard to help them balance that themselves versus having to hire people to come in and create the balance for them. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so now the next one is thinking versus feeling. And I yeah. was a feeling person. And if you know me, that's not surprising at all. Yeah, and again, you and I share this preference. And this is a really, really interesting preference. I typically tell people when we think about interpersonal conflict. So have you ever met someone and you sort of instantly, you know, either didn't like them or had some sort of uh, revulsion is probably too strong of a word, but you had some sort of sense of like, oh, that doesn't quite fit for me, or maybe had the sensation that they had that experience with you. This is the dichotomy, in my opinion, where that happens. And the reason that this one is so important on that particular point is because Thinking and feeling is actually a value system from my perspective. It's about information and what we value and what we prioritize. So you and I are going to prioritize the humanistic consideration of any decision that's going to be made. Does this help people? Um, Is this doing good? Is this putting something good into the world? And we're motivated and more importantly, we're committed to those things. In fact, if you want to see the, you know, the less friendly side of you and I, then violate those things, right? And you're going to see a different version of us. We're not going to be friendly. We're going to be like, hey, you're violating our value system here and it's not right and we're not going to stand for it. And so we're very committed to this value system. Well, on the other side, the thinking folks are very logic oriented. So while we're humanistic and maybe relational in nature, they're very logical and then transactional in nature. So they're going to come to the conversation with their data, with their bottom line, mm-hmm. with their logic, with their cause and effect, with their logic models that they are also passionately committed to. And so if they sit down and they, they do the math and it leads to a certain conclusion, they are committed to that conclusion. So when the two of us come together, they're bringing their numbers and we're bringing our subjective feelings about the humanistic side of it. Those two things don't often, well, maybe maybe that's not a fair statement. They don't always translate. Okay. And what happens in this conflict is if I sit back and I say, listen, I can see your numbers, but I'm not sure that they're going to be providing good to people. That person is going to feel like I've challenged what they value is their data. And they're going to be like, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. How do you measure how are, you know, how we're doing good or how are people happy? That uh-huh. doesn't add up for me. Uh-huh. And so they dig into that side and the conflict never gets resolved. And typically it ends up creating what I call scar tissue in the relationship. Oh, I like that one. Scar yeah. tissue in the relationship. Yeah. And then the last one is judging and perceiving represented by the letter J and P. Which I don't um, love. I don't like the word judging. It, it feels it feels like I'm being judged already. Like, I don't love that. So break it down for me because uh, so, you did this for me when we talked about it originally. I was like, okay, that, yeah. that makes sense. Okay, give me more. Yeah, just to, just to backtrack a tiny bit, the, the research that has gone into Myers-Briggs goes back 80 or 85 years back to a guy named Carl Young who was a contemporary of Sigmund Freud. So that gives you a sense of how far mm-hmm. back it goes. The reason I bring that up is the labeling that the Myers-Briggs folks put on this model is, is pretty old. There's no relationship really to the, the word judging sure. and how we think of judging, judgmental, being judged. Yeah. It really doesn't have that relationship with this particular side of the dichotomy. In this case, the word judging, or we'll use the letter J to represent it, is really about folks who prefer to have structure in their lives. Um, J folks often have a plan, Mm -hmm. um, and the plan is usually pretty comprehensive. And what I mean by that is you've thought through the alternatives and you've made a decision. And once that decision is made, you're moving forward. Uh 
Um, you, you have a map out, you know, when the delivery dates are, you know, what's needed to be successful. You probably have already thought about contingencies for when things don't necessarily go right. You've got a plan for that too. The other side of the dichotomy is perceiving. And again, it doesn't mean that people with a perceiving preference are more perceptive. The, the word, the label doesn't really mm -hmm. match here. This is where you, another area where you and I aren't the same. I'm on the perceiving side of it. People with that perceiving preference are often, um, I, I, the framing I use is a good, better, best mentality. We're, we want to see something. And when we see that thing, we think, how can we improve it? How can we make it better? How can we, how can we combine a couple of things and really make this thing great? Notice some of the big differences here. I'm always ideating around making something better. So my self-perception about my value to a team or to an organization is the ability to see those opportunities. Your value to the organization is to take that idea and get it across the finish line. Hmm. However, if you and I don't know that we have very different styles, what's going to happen is you're going to perceive me as a threat to your ability to get the thing sure. done. Why? Because I'm always coming up with these new ideas. New ideas. Yeah. We had a plan. Why did you, why did you stray? Why are you giving exactly. me this class? Yeah. It was a great plan. A lot of work went into it. And if we try to consider your, your new idea, we've got to go back and rework the whole plan and reset expectations and yeah. everything that goes into it. Well, not only that, but you're if, if we're both working on the same team and you're working to make our team plan better, that I had a big hand in creating the plan, it looks like you're al almost coming at me, yeah, not just the plan, if, if we aren't aware of those just different personality pieces. That's, well, that's such a Okay, such a carry on. Fun, I can feel it. I can feel it. Tell me such what a fun brain, comment. What, what, what did your brain just uh, alert to when, you, when I said that? Notice how you personalized it by saying, it feels like you're coming at me. That's actually your F. Okay. Your, the feeling. Feeling, your feeling type yeah. influencing your, your J type. Yeah, makes sense. What a, what a fun, fun connection for me. So yeah, that's right. You're going to, you're going to feel like I'm challenging you as a person. Even though, and especially if I'm a T, I'm just looking at the results here and it doesn't add up. Sure. Right. Yeah. But you're going to internalize that as maybe something yeah. else. Yeah. Okay. So, with all of these letters, is there a pairing that you find the most conflict coming out of that you have to do the most work with when you work with teams? I don't know that there's a common one from an engagement standpoint, but I can give you a couple of things to think about. Okay. So if we go all the way back through the model, um, S types are very tactical and J types are very executionally oriented. Mm -hmm. That combination is what I consider to be the most change resistant of the types, mm. right? The S types don't necessarily see the big picture, so they don't see the value and the new ideas that are creating change to begin with. Mm. They want to they see a problem, solve a problem, and all of this extra stuff feels like noise to them. When we pair that with the J, the J wants those decisions made and they're already moving forward. And so new ideas feel like, uh, like a mm -hmm. threat or like a disruption to your ability to be able to get things done. On the other side, the N and the P pairing, which is actually you know, my particular type, because we normally think strategically before, because we no normally thinking big picture, and then we couple that with this whole ideation, always looking for something that's good, right. better, or best. Uh -huh. We are constantly in a state of change because from yeah. our perspective, it is in fact the value that we bring back to a team. Yeah. And if you're someone who struggles with change, that could definitely be a, a conflict space. Yeah. Yeah. So- one of the things that I, I tell my clients who may have a J preference as you do working okay. for a P type boss. Ooh, okay. Right. So really interesting combination because the P boss is always coming up with these new ideas and trying to make the thing better. And the J person is just trying to get the things delivered and across the finish line and is very motivated by that. 
you want to be careful from the J perspective of not building up the reputation of being the no person. I can't do it. It's not going to be good. Not going to get it done, right? And reframe that in terms of how you handle it. And it looks something like this. You say to your P-boss, oh, I love that idea. So we're validating that the idea has value. Love that idea. That's super interesting. I can probably get that done in phase two. And so what we're doing is we're not saying no, we're saying no right now. Mm. And that's a really, really different um, way of sort of handling the conflict, the inherent conflict yes. that can come from those two types. Yes. How do we operationalize it and make it make us be able to work together? Now, what's funny to me in a very ironic sense is that when you validate the P, the P will then go away. Like, okay, you've got this, right? By the time you get to phase two, it's actually going to look like something different already anyway, because more ideas will come down the pipe. And so in a sense, you sort of have eliminated the need to rework something time mm -hmm. and time again, because the thought process will have matured from that P and they'll mm -hmm. come to something that's probably better in the end. So mm -hmm. when you start working on that, you're going to end up with a much better, better product. One of the other framings, Julie, that I, that I tell folks here it is. No, no great new product, no great new market disrupting innovation was ever conceived without a P. And that makes yes. sense, right? All the yes. ideation that goes into it. But that's only half of the sentence. The other half of the sentence is no great new product, no great, you know, new market disrupting whatever ever saw the light of day without a J. You got to get it across the finish line. Mm hmm. And so when you understand the symbiosis between those mm. two types, yeah. really magnificent things can happen. But in most teams, because we don't have the assessment in play and the knowledge of the modeling, mm. it makes it really difficult for us to see and understand those who are not us right. and the value that they bring. And therefore, we never get a chance to connect. Yeah. And that makes everybody want to run out and go take their Myers-Briggs assessment and walk around with it on our lapel. So we all know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I love when, I, when, when I first did the assessment, I, as I mentioned, my wife and I were both at Apple at the time. And that's exactly what we did. We would post our time yes. on, on the outside of our cubicle. Yes. So notice what you can do with having that information. If I need to come to you, and I need to ask you something or I need to influence you in a certain direction. Maybe I'm working on a project and I need a certain outcome and you can help me get there. How am I going to approach you? Well, the first thing I'm not going to do is come at you. We use the word authenticity a lot today, which I have a, a lot of value in. I'm not going to come at you fully authentically me mm. because I already know that my communication approach to you is not going to work. Mm. Right. Because I'm going to be talking about all these great ideas and you're going to be saying, I don't know how to make that happen. I don't know how to deliver yeah. that. And oh, by the way, you keep changing your mind. Yeah. Right? Which is so stressful. Right. Also, yeah. my introversion, especially if, and I have, this is really true for me. If I'm not thinking about it, I'm going to come to you in a very introverted state, which is going to look like calm, reserved, uh -huh. maybe, maybe neutrally energetic. And you're not going to get any excitement from that. And it's going to make it hard for you to get excited uh -huh. about whatever about it is this that idea. I'm trying to get done. Right. Yeah. yeah. However, yeah. if I know your INF or your ENFJ, what I'm going to do is I'm going to think, I need to bring some enthusiasm to this mm -hmm. conversation, some excitement, some energy, yeah, some forward momentum and inertia, right? Yeah. Um, I need to bring the big picture to you. If I come in talking about details and how to, you're going to lose excitement and you're going to be like, oh, I don't want that. But if I bring you that big picture with some energy and enthusiasm, yeah. and then I pinpoint the humanistic side and I say to you, Julie, this thing is going to help people in these three ways. And then I say, listen, I've got an idea about how we can structure, yeah. how we roll this out. Yeah. You're going to be all in. Yeah. It's like prepping for your round. It's like prepping for the debate round prior to the debate, right? You have to have done your homework just a little bit. And I, I love what I love most about what you're sharing is that it makes you be intentional about conversations with people, yeah. being intentional 
in those relationships and in those conversations in every space is going to get you better connections. It's going to create a better working relationship, which in turn is going to create a culture people want to be around. Exactly. want to be a part of. Yeah. Exactly. So it, it does take being intentional. Even if you aren't doing the Myers-Briggs assessment across the board and putting it on your cubicle, uh, it's still getting to know, okay, this person functions this way, That, but Myers-Briggs is a fast track. Yeah. Myers-Briggs, yeah. So you, you mentioned in the intro Myers-Briggs and DISC. Myers-Briggs mm-hmm. is a four-dimensional assessment. We've looked at those four dimensions. Another psychometric that we use is called everything DISC, which is a two-dimensional psychometric. So when I'm working with career clients, my career clients, we usually will dig into Myers-Briggs, but it takes more work and effort to be able to operationalize it. Yeah. When we're working with corporate clients and especially groups, we typically use everything DISC because it's much faster and easier to start working on. Mm. That's a good note. That's a great note. But to your to your point, this idea of one being aware of who you are, what are your preferences? And I just want to toss this caveat on there's there's no good, there's no bad, there's no value judgment associated with who you are. What I can tell you is there are pros and there are cons and there are superpowers and there are blind spots. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter which version of Myers Briggs you show up as. Those things are always present. But start with who you are. And then understand how others are and Mm -hmm. then do a little bit of work to sort of, again, cross Mm -hmm. that bridge so Mm -hmm. that you're, I often tell people, get on the frequency of your audience, get on the frequency of your audience, figure out who they are and speak to them where they are. I'll toss in one other concept here and then we can, we can move on. You've heard of the golden rule. Most people have, you know, treat others how you like to be treated. Yeah. And it's a good, it's a good place to be, but in reality, it's not the best. Do do you know why? What comes to mind? Well, of course it, you know, I was in the classroom for 13 years. So what comes to mind is how I want to be treated is very different because what I know and what I need is very different than the person sitting next to me. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we call that the platinum rule. Yeah. Which is treat others how they want to be treated. Mm. And if you don't understand how they want to. That's a writer downer. That's a sit down and write that one down. Uh, Because that's, that is so powerful. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know how they want to be treated, then, you know, you have a, and I'm just pulling this number out of the air, but you have a 50, 50 chance of getting it right with them. Sure. Sure. Well, and it still goes back to when I, when I work with teams on their culture and people talk about the kind of culture they want. And they throw out the idea of we, we want a culture of trust. Okay, well, my idea of trust and yours might be very different. And what I value and what you value, and where I come from, right? Like all of those pieces that make us who we are, are different. So we can't just throw a word out and assume that everybody knows what that means. We have to give some context to it uh, so that everybody can be on the same page. Yeah, I, I love that you're talking about trust here. It's, it's really true. Um, we, we do a lot of work with our clients around trust and building trust. And one of the first exercises that we do is we break people up into their psychometric groups and we ask them, what does trust mean to you? And how do you define trust? And how do people earn trust with you? And how do people lose trust with you? And you will be amazed at how different that landscape what those looks conversations based look on like. Mm-hmm. Yep. Those conversations are my very favorite thing to do. Yeah. And I think yeah, that's when you start. You. I think even if you're listening and you're like, okay, what am I taking away from this? Because I am i don't necessarily have the uh, tools or resources to go out and put my whole team through an assessment like this or even Enneagram. I have another friend who does Enneagram and we can have similar conversations, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think it still boils down to taking the time to have those conversations, yeah. to get to know your people to get to know what they need uh, and and to be able to share authentically what it is you need also, um, even if you're just on the team as a peer or if you're the leader. I think it's very impactful. And this is, man, these are such good pieces. And I know we could talk all day long about all of the pieces, especially when you started, when we walked through the 
extrovert versus introvert pieces. I, I, I know like instantly ways to work with people uh, who are opposite of me just by the conversation that you and I have. So I, I would encourage everyone to check you out. Um, I'm going to add his information in the show notes. So if working with iBridge or just learning a little more is something that you're interested in, make sure that you tap into that. But Jeff, what are from our conversation today, three takeaways you hope the audience heard? Yeah. I want to add one that I want to consider a takeaway. Okay, it's it's simply it. this. There are a ton of free resources and information on psychometrics on the web. Um, we've given you the Myers-Briggs modeling and we mentioned the DISC modeling, but there are free assessments out there that you can go take if budget is a concern for you. So the first takeaway is go explore those and, mm -hmm. and do the work to understand yourself. The second component is when, once you've done that, um, take a little bit of time, something that you said, Julie, which I think is a home run, which is start telling people what you need, mm. whether it's informational or engagement or be specific about what you need and put that into the world. And the framing for me is help other people be successful in engaging with you. Give them the map of how yes. to do that. Right? Yes. And then the third component is understand yourself in a way that enables you to then get on the frequency or be in the lane, connecting with the audience, whoever that is, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter if it's in person or if it's being done electronically, but figure out what adjustments and what adaptations you need to make to more effectively connect and communicate with the people that you're connecting with. Those are so good. Are Thank so you. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for sharing so many golden nuggets. Okay. Our challenge. I'd love to wrap it up with a challenge. What have you, what do you have for us today? Yeah. So whether you've gone out and done an assessment or not, um, whether you've done any of that, whether you're interested in learning more about these models or not, the challenge today is to go do something that I call mirroring. Mm. Mirroring is you do what you see. So every time you meet somebody new, as you're speaking with them, observe all of their characteristics, their pace of speech, how much movement and motion is going on, what sort of expressions are they showing, um, also listening to what they're talking about. Are they talking about what and how? Are they being tactical or are they talking about being more strategic and theoretical? Allow yourself to do what it is that you see and what you hear through mirroring. And the reason that this is a challenge is you don't have to have any of this other modeling. Your body will viscerally tell you who you're talking to. So I challenge everybody who's an in the audience today yeah. to go practice that and have great fun exercise. With it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great exercise. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Quote your favorite quote, grow us. Yeah, it's it, this is my favorite quote too, and it's it's so simple. Um, it's attributed to Bruce Lee, the martial artist, mm. and the quote is, "Your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness." Mm. I feel like that's so thought provoking. We need extra homework. I don't, that's a lot. <laughs> That's wonderful. For me, for me, the connotation is simply this. You may be a great extrovert and that may be your superpower. But when you go connect with introverts, it's probably a weakness and mm -hmm. you're not even aware of it. Mm. And so the quote to me says, understand what it is that makes you great. Also understand that that's going to create some, bi some blind yes. spots with certain people or in certain situations. I'd love for you to have an awareness around. Yeah, that's so good and so helpful with everyone that you're in relationship with. So absolutely, I hope that I hope that you can visit with me again because I've really enjoyed getting to know myself more as we walked through my ENFJ uh, and just kind of picking apart what this looks like and how we can be better at building relationships with people in our space. So thank you so much, Jeff. It was an honor to be Bye. here, Julie. Thanks so much yeah. for the invitation. Oh, always. Oh, I loved it. Okay. Have a great week and don't forget your challenge because that could be super effective in growing you. See you next week. 
Hey, thanks for listening and being my people. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, hook me up with a five-star review. And as always, don't forget to subscribe to the People Priority Podcast so you don't miss out on more tips, tricks, and important reminders. I'll see you next week.